Gauss's Law and Electric Flux going to be the topic of this lesson in my new General Physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now in this lesson, we're going to define electric flux. Uh, we're going to talk about how Gauss's Law can be used to calculate electric flux, uh, and then we'll talk about how both of those can be used to calculate the electric field. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Now, before we dive into providing a definition for electric flux, we first got to give a shout out to Mrs. Yanashima's chemistry classes at Basis Scottsdale. Uh, it was nice to meet you all today. You guys made me feel like a celebrity for a couple hours. All right, so let's talk about electric flux for a minute. So electric flux is really a measure of the electric field passing through a surface. So we can kind of see here, I've got a lovely uh, parallelogram of some sort uh, with electric field lines passing through it, and there'll be a corresponding electric flux associated with that. So, and as long as the field lines are coming through kind of perpendicular to the surface, it really is just the magnitude of the electric field times the area of the surface. So a surface area, if you will. Uh, if they're not coming through perpendicular, then you gotta factor in that angle. And we take it into account with a cosine of theta. Now you gotta be careful with how theta is defined here. Theta is not the angle the electric field is making with the surface. Theta is how far from the perpendicular, how far from the normal we say, uh, that's what theta actually is. So in this case, if you were, instead of being perfectly perpendicular, you had an angle of 89 degrees from the surface. Well, that would mean you're only one degree from being perpendicular and the theta you would use would be one degree, not 89 degrees. So just something to keep in account there. Now, in addition to our two dimensional surface, we also wanna consider a three dimensional surface and specifically a fully enclosed surface like a sphere here. So and if this was in some sort of external electric field, uh, we'd have electric field lines entering into the sphere, so but they'd also be exiting the sphere as well. Now, in terms of electric flux, when you've got a fully enclosed surface, we consider the electric field lines that are exiting the fully enclosed surface as positive electric flux, and those that are entering it as negative electric flux. And in the example shown here, the electric field lines that enter are perfectly matched by the electric field lines that exit, and so the negative electric flux and the positive electric flux would be of exactly the same magnitude. And that way the overall electric flux would be equal to zero. And again, it's easy to see if, if you've got some sort of external magnetic, or I'm sorry, external electric field here, uh, every field line that does enter the sphere should be exiting the sphere. The only way this would not be true is if there were some source uh, of electric field lines either in the sphere where they're either originating or terminating, and that way not everyone that entered would be exiting. So it wouldn't be a balance that in that case. So the only way that's gonna happen then is after, if the, inside this surface, there's some sort of charge inside, which there wasn't in this case. And that's kind of what Gauss's Law talks about. If we take a look at Gauss's Law, so most common way you'll see it expressed here, another formula for the electric flux. In this case, the Q Inside, if there's an enclosed charge all over epsilon naught here, epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. It's another constant, and it's one we've kind of visited without knowing we've visited it, as we'll see. But it's 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, and that's coulombs per newton meter squared. Now, it turns out I'm giving this in terms of epsilon naught, and that's the most common way you're going to see this. But uh, what you don't know is that Coulomb's constant is actually equal to 1 over 4 pi times epsilon naught, where we got that 8.99 times 10 to the ninth that we've seen earlier in the chapter. So it turns out the Coulomb's constant and the permittivity of free space are related to each other. And so sometimes you'll see this written instead as, uh, of Q inside over epsilon naught, you'd actually see it written as Q inside times 4 pi times K, it turns out, because they're going to solve for 1 over epsilon naught and see that it's equal to 4 pi times Coulomb's constant. So you might see it the other way, but this is probably the most common way you'll see it. So that's the, definitely the way I'm including it here in this lesson. But what you see from this though, is that if for an enclosed surface, there's no enclosed charge, like the situation we had over here. Well, in such cases, if the, if the total enclosed charge is zero, then the electric flux net is going to be zero as well, just as it was here. And we can come up with a very simple formula though, is if you do know the magnitude of the total enclosed charge, a very simple formula for calculating the net electric flux through that closed surface. So that's kind of what we're gonna deal with in a couple of problems we're gonna see from here. Let's take a look. So 
So the first problem we're going to take a look at includes this lovely diagram here. And the question simply says, what are the electric fluxes through sphere A and through sphere B? And so to calculate electric flux, we really have two methods we can do this. If we know information about the electric field and the surface area of whatever surface we're talking about, great, this would be the way to go. So, but what's nice here in this case, and the one we're going to use with Gauss's law, all we have to know is the total magnitude of the enclosed charge. That's it. Nothing else matters. We have a very simple formula for doing that. And so in this case for A, the only enclosed charge is that two nano coulombs. And so our electric flux, which again equals the Q inside over epsilon naught, real straightforward calculation here, but that two nano coulombs, so 2.0 times 10 to the negative nine coulombs, all over the 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. And again, oh, I lost this, coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. And our electric flux here, let's let our calculator do the heavy lifting for us. All right, so two times 10 to the negative nine divided by 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. Uh, in this case, we're gonna get 225.988. And if we get that down to two sig figs, that's gonna round up to 230. Uh, and in this case, you take a look at your units here. So uh, one of the coulombs is going to cancel down here, but we're going to be left with one coulomb left. That's going to be in the numerator, I'm sorry, the denominator. So when you factor it in, and you're going to get Newton meter squared per coulomb. So it turns out that's the SI unit. And we could drive that back from the first expression pretty readily, because again, cosine theta doesn't have any units, but uh, electric field is Newtons per coulomb, and then area is meters squared. And so the units work out just like they should. So there's the total electric flux through sphere A, now through sphere B. So it doesn't matter that there's multiple charges. The only thing that matters is the total charge in the enclosed surface. In this case, it's two nanocoulombs there, another one nanocoulomb there for a total of three nanocoulombs, but a very similar looking calculation then. And so the electric flux equals now a total of 3.0 times 10 to the negative nine coulombs, again, all over the permittivity of free space. And once again, we'll let our calculator do the heavy lifting for us. And because of the similarity, I'm just putting in my last entry and changing a two times 10 to the minus nine to a three times 10 to the minus nine. And we should get a number that's about 50% bigger or exactly 50% bigger and 338.98, which is gonna round up on two sig figs to 340. And again, that's gonna be a Newton meters squared per coulomb or newtons per coulomb times meters squared. Take your pick. Uh, but there's our two answers, very straightforward calculations. Uh, let's look at this one step further because uh, we can use Gauss's law and, and the definition of electric flux. Uh, and most common example you're gonna see this applied to is calculating electric fields. Let's take a look. So the next question we're gonna take a look at involves this lovely diagram right here where we've got a solid sphere in the center and then a hollow conducting sphere around it and the question says, if the charge on the solid sphere at the center of the diagram is positive 4.0 nanocoulombs and the charge on the hollow outer, outer sphere is positive 7.0 nanocoulombs, then determine the magnitude of the electric field at a radius of 0.001 meters and at a radius of 0.0025 meters. So, and again, the big thing here is that Gauss's law teaches us that we can calculate the electric flux and the only thing we have to know is what is the total uh, uh, magnitude of included charge inside that surface. And so we can see here at 0 0.0010 meters, well, the only charge that's included is a total of positive four nanocoulombs. Whereas for this blue one at a, at a, at a radius of 0 0.0025, we include both the seven and the four for a total of 11. So uh, this is a, you know, sometimes a, a much easier way of calculating electric field, especially, you know, we've, we learned with Coulomb's law that we can calculate electric fields due to point charges. So, but with more complex shapes, if, as long as they've got a little bit of symmetry, it turns out, uh, Gauss's law is often a, a way we can calculate them when Coulomb's law might not apply because we don't actually have point charges. We can totally use it here. So let's take a look here. Since uh, electric flux is defined as Ea cosine theta, but Gauss's law tells us it's also equal to Q, uh, the total charge inside over epsilon naught, we can set those equal to each other here and get Ea cosine theta equals the total charge inside over epsilon naught 
And in this question, we're trying to solve for the electric field. So we can rearrange this just a little bit and solve for that electric field. So the electric field is going to equal Q inside all over A times epsilon naught times cosine of theta. Now, if we take a look here, so we learned uh, in the last lesson with conductors at electrostatic equilibrium that the electric field lines are always coming off a surface perpendicular. So if we tried to draw some of those electric field lines, we'd see that they're coming off that surface perpendicular everywhere. And the reason I bring that up is that means they're also perpendicular to our spherical surface everywhere, which means that theta here is going to be zero and the cosine of zero is one. And so this term is effectively just going to drop out because anything times one is itself. That's going to make our life a little bit easier. So in this case, we're just going to run this calculation twice with just changing the value of Q and changing the value of A. We've got to remember that we're dealing with spherical surfaces now, and the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So if you didn't remember that, that's going to be crucial for this one here. Uh, but from there, it's just plugging and chugging. So in this case, we've got uh, for the 0 0.0010 meters, we're going to have Q total again is 4 nanocoulombs, so 4.0 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs, all over the area of 4 pi, and then again, the radius of 0 0.0010 meters, and don't forget to square it, uh, times that epsilon naught, 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, and I'm going to leave the units off because uh, I'm out of room, and I would, not what I would recommend you do, but it would look terrible if I included it here, so I'll leave that off, and from here we'll do some plugging and chugging. Uh, so we got 4 times 10 to the negative 9 divided by, I'll put it all in parentheses, 4 times pi times 0 0.001 squared, and times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, close my parentheses, and lo and behold, we get a rather large number, and if we round this to two sig figs, uh, it comes up to 3.5967218 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th. And we'll round that up to 3.6 times 10 to the 7th. And that comes out in newtons per coulomb for electric field. All right, so that's at the radius of 0 0.0010 meters. Now let's do it for the radius of 0 0.0025 meters. And it's really going to be a very similar looking calculation here. But the total charge inside is now the 7 plus the 4 for a total of 11 nanocoulombs, which I should write as 11 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs, uh, all over 4 pi. And it's now zero, a radius of 0 0.0025 meters. If we get to square that, and then the permittivity of free space, 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. And again, that's Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. And once again, we'll let our calculator do the heavy lifting for us. And again, I just did a fairly similar looking calculation. I'm going to use the second, fun uh, second function entry uh, to get that up there. And then change the 4 to an 11 times 10 to the negative 9 and then change the 0 0.001 meters to 0 0.0025 meters, and the rest should be good. Uh, in this case, 1582557.6 points some change, uh, and we're gonna round that to 1.6. Times 10 to the, and let's see if it's still to the seventh here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, yeah, still times 10 to the seventh. Newtons per coulomb. Let's just check and make sure this makes sense here because our electric field went down. And so our overall enclosed charge did go up. It went from four nanocoulombs to uh, 11 nanocoulombs, almost tripled. And if the amount of charge enclosed inside almost tripled, then the electric field would almost triple. So, but the radius went up by a factor of two and a half from 0.001 to 0.0025, and we're squaring that. And so if the radius goes up by 2.5, the radius squared goes up by 2.5 squared, and we're dividing by that number. That's going to cause the electric field to go down by 2.5 squared. And if you look, so tripling on the one count, but dividing by 2.5 squared on the other count, and overall, that's 0.48. It says our number should have been roughly cut in half and a little bit more. And 3.6 cut in half will be 1.8 and a little bit more. So this makes perfect sense.
If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.